Mission Peak, also known as Mission Ridge. This is the peak up here, about 2,600 feet. Launch is about 1,900 feet. This is the ridge. It's the site of the first over hour long soaring flight on a hang glider. This flight of mine was April 23rd, 2008, one of the best flights of my life. I didn't do video back then, so I had this flight track and I had written up the story. So now I'm going to try and coincide the two. So I titled it Cut the Umbilical Cord, Mission to Manteca 2008. The low pressure was hanging around and I was feeling better. So early Wednesday, I made some calls and ended up convincing one paraglider and one hang glider pilot to meet me in the parking lot early. At 11.30, the flag was mostly limp and with a southy direction, but the sky looked awesome with popcorn clouds mixed with a few cumies at least a thousand feet tall. A higher cloud base would have been nice, but it looked like at least 4,000 feet. Two other paragliders showed up to fly, so we all loaded up in my truck and headed up the hill. By the time we got to the top, it was blowing straight in at about 10, but it was also overdeveloping and raining over the bay. Well, I've survived setting up and getting rained on in the past, so I pulled the glider off my truck, but my hopes of actually going somewhere dropped considerably since there is almost no sun hitting the ground upwind of us. The paragliders launch and are barely climbing, only getting about 500 feet over, as I'm putting new batteries in my Vario and loading my camel back in the harness for the first time this year. The wind picks up as the overcast area has now reached launch, but the rainy areas have broken up and the sun is starting to break through at the edge of the bay. I launch right away and hit light lift, so I follow it towards Ohlone College, hoping to catch a good thermal out front. Nothing worth really staying in, but I follow the lift line all the way to the power lines before it peters out. I've gained a few hundred feet, but I know there's got to be a real thermal around here somewhere. I had intended to fly south, but the overdeveloped area is blocking me from San Jose in this beautiful looking cloud streets. The wind isn't too strong. It is, isn't northy yet. So I consider continuing towards 680 and try and follow that range and then jump downwind to Diablo from there. My GPS tells me my ground speed is 21. That's pretty good for a crosswind. The Livermore Valley is completely sunny, except for one little cloud streak right over the north side of Lake San Antonio. And it lines up with me, still flying over shaded area, but right under the edge of where the clouds covering the entire bay end for a start. I spend more than a few hundred feet looking for the core I know has to be around here somewhere and my search has taken me from out front by the college to back to where the hills start. At this point, I realize if I don't run back to the ridge or towards the LZ immediately, I might not make it.
I see places I could land all around. So I cut the umbilical cord to mission's landing zone and go back into search mode. Finally hit a little bubble and my ease my way back into a circle, barely climbing, but climbing the entire 360. Now that I'm not attached to the usual LZ, I can really relax and enjoy this light yet solid thermal and follow the drift. It eventually brings me back to the same altitude as launch. But I can't see launch as I look at the back side of the ridge and watch Bob start to walk his glider out front. This is a cool view as I circle and look at the back of the cloud covered ridge and the open sunny Sonol and Livermore Valleys. And I'm gaining altitude, both MSL and AGO. By thermaling and having the hills drop off on the other side. At this point, I've got an easy glide into the Sonol Valley next to 680. So I can relax even more and focus on getting a thousand feet over launch for the first time. I wasn't going to leave the thermal I was in, but I started looking for a better core. I found some pops here and there, but still kept climbing slowly. Oh well, I don't mind. And at this point, the little thermal has drifted me across the Sonol area. and approaching Lake San Antonio, which is an area of major air traffic, but I'm still relatively low and there's not a plane in sight. As my helpful little thermal starts losing energy, or I start losing it, I notice my VG line is jammed in the cleat. I always tie a couple knots in the string so it can't slip all the way through, but for some reason this time, I try tied three. It turns out that doesn't leave any piece at the end to grab and pull it out, and it's wedged in there good. I start angling towards Highway 84 while I'm trying to dig the knot out. Thankfully, I'm not in sync, but I would definitely appreciate a better glide at this point. I'm zigzagging under the cloud street, but finding nothing. I realize it, that it's going to take two hands and some wasted altitude to get this VG working. So I'm a little ahead of myself. So this is where I was heading towards Highway 84. So I use my right hand to pull the line and take the pressure off the knot. Of course, as soon as I take my left hand off the bar, the thermal decides to arrive. So the VG will have to wait as I slip my hands back into the bar mitts and turn into a good core. This is more like it as I put it on a wingtip and feel the surge of this stronger but still smooth and solid thermal pull me towards a cloud a couple thousand feet above. I turn and turn, drift and drift, and it seems like I'm going to make it past Wente Vineyard's golf course, my previous furthest flight in this direction. I finally get my Aspire 2 altitude of a thousand feet above mission, and then a few hundred more before I lose it again. There's no big sink, but I can't seem to refine the core as I do widening circles in different directions. I start sinking a little more, so abandon the 360s and glide straight downwind for the first time. I start to think I should have searched harder as I fly into the first good sink of the flight, and it starts making to look like making it over the ridge behind Wente isn't a gimme anymore.
I'm indecisive, distracted, and disappointed that I'm losing extra altitude without my glider functioning 100%. There's no cloud shadows nearby, and I'm getting back to mission launch altitude. So I start focusing more on ground cues. Lake Del Val has a big rocky dam that's a dark gray color, so it's probably a good collector with the lip of the dam and the cooler water downwind being the trigger. I have to head south of the line I've been following since leaving though, and if I do catch a thermal, it could drift me into the hills with trees and bushes, so I decide against that. I'm coming down to meet the hills, or are they rising up to meet me? It's funny how fast they grow when you're in sync. I spent a half hour on this ridge the last time I was here, and I never got up. So I start resigning myself to the fact that it's safest to not try and squeak it over the ridge, and that there is a serious possibility of soon sitting in the clubhouse drinking beer. I think that relaxed me because I immediately decide to head towards the lone hill to the south instead of the main ridge. It had a slight or rocky area that faced the prevailing wind. And when I arrived there, I was 230 feet under mission launch. In retrospect, I think reattaching the umbilical cord triggered a memory when I had landed there before and then watched several vultures thermal in that area by the hill. Where was it? I landed over here. Well, I covered a lot of ground to reaffirm the fact that if there's sinking air, there's got to be rising air. And as I carve into this blasty little core, I can actually appreciate the first violent air I've hit all day. With just four or five turns, it's clear that I'm not landing at Wenty. And that this will be my furthest flight in that direction. Again, I experienced the gratifying feeling of gaining altitude while the hills disappear into the valley. But this time I'm in a little rocket. I don't even think about maximizing climb. Just keep the wingtip pointed down and spin and watch the hills shrink faster than they had grown on the other side. Now I'm sitting pretty, looking at the central valley and it's a glorious checkerboard of clouds. I'm still following the one sparse line of clouds that connects with the Santa Clara Valley, but there's a gap of just blue at the Altamont Pass. The thermal loses energy, and I'm still not getting all the way to cloud base but I continue to do slow turns. My altimeter parks at a number 1,554 feet above where I launched. I'm staying level and covering ground with the drift. Flying 360s at minimum sink, and the air is so smooth I can now easily take both hands off the bar and fix the VG problem. I'm super relaxed now as I slowly cross the last of the Livermore Valley, enjoying the view. I notice that Diablo has its head and a little bit of its shoulders in the clouds. Diablo here. And I think of Mike Soderstrom, who I had called earlier in the day, probably sitting there, not able to launch. Sorry, Diablo team. Sometimes your mountain might be better, but today mission rules. 
As the past grows nearer and nearer, my magic air starts dissipating. So I've got another decision to make. I'm pretty sure there's still enough altitude to make it over the pass, but it will be close if I hit sink. Normally it wouldn't be that much of an issue since there are no trees or shrubs to prevent landing anywhere, but I'm looking down at thousands of rotating blades. I always thought it'd be cool to fly over the wind farms, but I sure don't want to get anywhere near a windmill. I know there's a wind river running through it, and the chance of finding a thermal well crossing is slim to none. So it's a pretty easy decision to start flying north along the start of the hills, looking for a bubble. Not much is happening, so I reattach the ground by picking out a nice field by a house right where the road, Villarcitos, I think, heads up into the hill, hills. Now that that's taken care of, I can forget about the earth again and focus on the air. I guess I shouldn't say focus because it's more of an unfocus, letting my subconscious and the control bar feel the wind and lead me to some rising air. About the time I get over the chosen LZ, I feel I should angle the glider 45 degrees to the right. I still have plenty of altitude to search. Heck, I'm still higher than where I launched. I certainly don't want to go too deep, though, and I know the lower I get, the harder the headwind will, headwind will be to get back out. It doesn't matter, though, because I start feeling some texture to the air, then the sinky, sucky air that's got to be feeding into a thermal. I angle another 45 degrees, pull on a little speed, and use it to punch into an OK core and stick my wingtip where I think the center is. The first couple turns don't have a solid climb that I would like, but I adjusted and the Vario started to beat more regularly, and I left another LZ behind. I'm committed now. Maybe I should be committed. The climb isn't too great. The drift makes up for any shortcomings of the foot per minute, though, so I'm feeling pretty good turning and turning until I lose it after only gaining a few hundred feet. I don't waste any of that gain by searching too much because I'm already about halfway across. So start gliding to the other side. It's looking pretty good, but as I draw closer, I realize there's a worse problem in windmills. Power lines. Just on the other side of the pass is covered with power poles and lines of all shapes, sizes, running in every direction, and landing among the spinning blades if I sink out is now the better option. There's actually a farm in a wide valley right before the end of the hills. And with no windmills upwind and the venturi effect of the valley, the wind should be pretty clean to land there. It'll be windy, but the field is huge. And I don't think it's windy enough that I'll land going backwards. There's four or five windmills. On each side of the two hills framing the possible landing valley. 
and I still have enough altitude to try and pass along the face of one of them and choose the one on the right. As I get to the hill, the windmills are a place where I'd expect a thermal to trigger. So I fly my pass a few hundred feet directly above the blades. It looks like I picked right again as I'm rewarded with a bump, so I start to turn. The core is small, but it's solid, and after a couple turns, I already have drifted enough to have decided to abandon another LZ. Two more turns and I'm really locked into continuing, as gliding over the power lines looks pretty easy now. And I might even be able to make it to the Altamont Speedway or angle over and land close to 580. My lift stops rising me, but again, I'm able to stay level by continuing to turn. This is so unlike my lazy turning up high though, because the drift is wicked. Every time I turn into the wind, it feels like my ground speed stops and the glider wants to level out and park into the wind. Instead, I crank around downwind and then quickly and carefully try to come around on the backside as the ground is whizzing by. I'm managing to not fall out of the back or the front. And it's also exciting because I'm now low enough that my landing options are changing with every couple of turns. As I approach the speedway, I'm kind of surprised my super elongated 360s have kept me level, and the drift starts slowing down noticeably. There's a nice field right below me, easy to land and convenient to the road. As I'm looking down, I see vultures zooming around below me, and I keep turning because staying level is climbing and also gives me more time to find something. A bird downwind starts to turn below me, but I still don't dare stop turning because I'm only about 500 feet over the ground. I start extending my circles a little in his direction and feel a little sink and a little regret. But then I think what he's in coalesce with what I'm in and I'm finally in, again in a thermal that goes up instead of just sideways. The vertical really starts to outpace the horizontal as I approach Highway 580 by the speedway. And now can stop thinking about landing fields anywhere near me. I finally cleared the blue gap, and this is the lift. This lift is feeding a cloud at the very start of Tracy. And I'm soon there and about as high as I've been all day. I remember my camelback, take a drink, then decide to explore and there seems to be lift everywhere. There's not a cloud in sight to the south, but I follow a lift line for a while that heads into the blue. It seems to be heading towards Modesto and I consider trying for there, and maybe even McClure. Unfortunately, my track started taking me directly over the middle of Tracy. And even though I was sure I could make it with plenty of altitude, I stay legal and don't fly over a congested area. The view is incredible. With a patchwork of colorful farms, all the perfect looking clouds, and the usually polluted Central Valley air is so clear and crisp. I angle back towards 205 and I'm soon back under the clouds and still in lift. This is 205 over here.
I hit better lift and start to 360 again. The clouds seem to be perfectly spaced to the north and east of me, and I don't know where to go. Sacramento? Yosemite? Galt? Who knows? Making it to Highway 5 would be so cool, so I glide down Highway 205, still not losing much altitude. I bump into a nice core, so start to turn again. I've got some room to gain altitude, but still let stay legal under the clouds. The core is the most turbulent since the one by Wente, and I'm feeling and being high, I end up getting lackadaisical and falling out of the side. I yank the bar in and the glider rotates into a spinning dive and finally starts flying again with my feet well over my head. I'm high enough, so bailing out on that area is easy. Then suddenly I hear the sound of an engine. I'm looking all over for a plane, and then I hear it again, below me, and when I look down, it's, I realize it's a train thousands of feet below. It sure sounded close. I guess the sound is amplifying up. I reach Highway 5 and still don't know where to go. I'm not that familiar with this area. I'm also not familiar with the airspace around here. I've studied the sectionals for my route to Tracy and a little bit towards Patterson. Down this way. And there are a couple of restricted areas to avoid, but I have no idea if there's anything around where I'm at. I guess the wimpy side of me came out because I decided that I had gone far enough this time. I'm also being practical because I don't have a driver. Bob Radcliffe said he would pick me up, but we were talking about Gilroy. He lives in Felton and is married, so I can't really expect him to drive all the way to the foothills of the Sierras to pick me up. We probably wouldn't get back until the middle of the night. Now my decision of where to land is as perplexing as where to fly was. The GPS on my Vario doesn't have streets on it, so I'm looking at the layout of the roads so I can describe where to be picked up. I start to head south, leaving the cloud area, but this time don't have a lift line, so I start a slow, steady sink for the first time since entering the valley. There doesn't seem to be an exit from 205 to 5 south, so again, I start heading east. There is a good sized road that lines up with 205 just to the north of me. Found out later it's Highway 120. So head east again, lazily sinking, enjoying the view, flying over meandering river. Merced, I think. I see a cool looking round island and fly over the top and there's a small lake with water ski jumps. There's so many beautiful places to land. but most of the fields are green or freshly plowed. So I pick one that's fallow. The wind direction is obvious as there are farmers plowing here and there, and I spot a small dust devil sprouting up in a field. The shadows of the clouds also match the direction of the dirt on the ground. Everything is out of the west at about 10 miles per hour. The fields are so huge. that I misjudge my downwind run. And when I turn back into the wind, I realize that I probably won't be landing in the green field right below me instead of on the dirt clods I had intended. That's fine with me because it's a grass farm. 
so I won't be destroying a crop, but there are white sprinkler lines laid out perpendicular to my final. I realize I will be about 20 feet short of my intended field, so I adjust my line to avoid any of the sprinkler heads sticking up, pull on more speed, rotate upright, transition my hands, and touch down softly with a nice little flare. I carry the glider across the street to be in the wind shadow of a small orchard, and an older lady pulls up in a pickup truck. She's surprised that I came from Fremont and asks one of the worst woof questions ever. How do you hang on to that thing for so long? I show her the hang strap and how the harness attaches and explain it usually doesn't take that much physical energy to steer it. She's really nice and we talk for a little while. Then just before she pulls away, I remember to ask her for directions. She doesn't even have to write them down for me. I'm only two turns off Highway 120, Airway, then Nile. As she pulls away, she stops, rolls her window back down, points at the glider and asks, what do you call that thing? What a reminder of what a niche sport we're in to have to tell someone who is at least in their 60s that it's a hang glider. I call Bob and I'm not surprised when he doesn't answer because I've only been gone less than two hours. He had left his cell phone in his van at the bottom and he could still be flying, but then I remembered he said his battery was low. I call a few people to line up an alternate ride just in case and find a non-pilot friend willing to pick me up. I would have to drive my truck back to get the glider, but right now I'm so jazzed about the flight that I feel like I could walk back to get my truck. Now that's taken care of, I roll up the glider and get a call from Bob, who's done flying and is calling me from the parking lot at Mission. I give him directions, but forget to ask if he landed at the bottom, had rolled his glider up, or if he had top landed and brought my truck down. I decide not to call and use up his low battery. He gets here when he gets here and hiking up from the back gate to get my truck is no big deal. The lady in the pickup truck stops as she's driving by and asks if I need something to drink or anything else. And I say, no thanks, I brought provisions. I call a bunch of people I know to crow about my flight, walk around and look at the longhorn bulls and llamas, watch two big jackrabbits run out of the orchard into the huge grass field I landed in. And within a couple hours, Bob pulls up. It ended up being a hundred mile round trip drive for him to pick me up for a 37 mile flight and we weren't even late for dinner.